So I think there is a causal link, and the evidence suggests that there is a causal link between um, participation in globalization and improvements in um, various measures of well-being and prosperity, and in particular, in the reduction of people in extreme poverty. Following the uh, um, experience of the pandemic, there's a great deal of discussion about how we perhaps should do things differently, reset the economy. And there are two elements to this discussion. The first is uh, um, people often look at what has happened in relation to COVID and say that actually everything was terrible before COVID and COVID gives us an opportunity to do things differently so that things can be better. Uh, there are other people who look at the experience of COVID and say that there are lessons from that experience, that we may uh, experience such uh, events in the future again, uh, viruses or other forms of uh, natural catastrophe, and that there are uh, lessons for how we should manage such things, and in particular that there needs to be a greater role uh, of government in the economy and civil life in order to help us to become more resilient. I argue that both of these perspectives are wrong, but let's first of all uh, provide a flavour of what some people have said in relation to this issue. So Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, has said, as we do restart our businesses and our lives, we must grasp the historic opportunity before us to learn the lessons of this awful pandemic and build back better, levelling up across our United Kingdom and fixing the problems that have held back too many people for too long. Pope Francis, taking a more global perspective, has uh, outlined similar sentiments. In a speech to the United Nations, Pope Francis said, this pandemic can represent a concrete opportunity for conversion, for transformation, for rethinking our way of life and our economic and social systems, which are widening the gap between rich and poor based on an unjust distribution of resources. Or the pandemic can be the occasion for a defensive retreat into greater individualism and elitism. Of course, I wouldn't want a, a defensive retreat into greater individualism and elitism, but it really isn't true to say that before the pandemic, the gap between rich and poor was widening, as we shall see. Klaus Schwab, the founder and chief executive of the World Economic Forum, has said, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine and reset our world. But this leads to an interesting question. Why do we have to build back better or reset the economy following COVID? Shouldn't we just accept COVID as an awful event, which we must deal with so that we can then return to business as normal? In other words, return to the old normality rather than create a new normality. Well, the answers people have fall into two categories. Some people say that the old normal was terrible and that this has been revealed by the pandemic and therefore we have to pursue a new normal. Effectively, this is the view of the uh, Vatican and specifically the Diocastri for Integral Human Development, which has written, the COVID-19 pandemic is the defining crisis of this generation. It is laid bare the inequities and injustices that threaten people's well-being, safety and lives and exacerbated an interconnected set of crises, economic, ecological, political, social, that disproportionately impact the poor and most vulnerable. This is questionable, it has to be said, but I'm also not sure it's relevant. We could instead say, COVID has demonstrated that those who are poor are vulnerable to economic health and ecological shocks because they lack the savings to ensure their resilience and because they live in countries where governments have limited institutional capacity to deal with the difficulties thrown up by such events. And as such, we need to ensure the most rapid economic development possible in poorer countries. And this really just takes us back to what kind of approach to economic policy is best for reducing uh, poverty, improving healthcare and education, and so on amongst the world's poorest people most quickly. And I would argue that this was, and remains, an approach that involves the building of good political institutions, uh, 
good justice systems, uh, good protection of private property rights, free markets and free trade. And none of this is really changed by COVID. The attempt to use COVID as a mechanism to open up these debates, I think, is flawed. I certainly wouldn't argue that the period from 1980 to 2020, to take the last 40 years, was perfect by any means. But as we shall see, it was a period of immense progress. And that progress was driven by a move towards more open markets in many countries. Now, we might look at countries such as China and think these are still countries which are very heavily state controlled. But we have to reflect on the fact that if you go back 40 years, countries such as China and other Asian countries were effectively Maoist hermit kingdoms where the state controlled absolutely every aspect of economic life. So even if things are not perfect today, there are considerable improvements on, what, on the situation um, 40 years ago. And I think if you, need, if you believe that we need to do a reset and move towards some kind of new normality post-Covid, you have to prove both of two things. First of all, um, that beliefs about the ability of globalisation, markets and good institutions being the best way to reduce poverty are not valid. And secondly, that the impact of Covid was actually greatest amongst the poor. And certainly if you take an international perspective, the latter would not appear to be true, as I shall explain. But let's look first at how we were doing before Covid struck. The key feature of the post-1980 era was the increased interconnectedness through globalisation and rapid adoption by many countries that were previously desperately poor of an environment that was closer, though in many cases only slightly closer, to something that looks like a, a, a Western economy with institutions that protect private property, free markets and promote uh, the flourishing of business. One aspect of this was the development of a, a more globalised economy, what we might call the modern age of, of globalisation. And something which made um, this age of globalisation rather different from previous eras of globalisation is the development of long, complex, integrated supply chains. And I'll come back to this uh, later because of the supposed problems caused by such supply chains in the Covid crisis. So if you take a company such as Toyota, for example, if you go back 40 or 50 years, Toyota produced nearly, nearly all of almost all cars uh, entirely in Japan. Today, Toyota has 51 overseas uh, operations outside Japan uh, in 28 different countries of par as part of its global supply chain. Uh, that, ex that excludes suppliers that are not actually owned by Toyota. And then it sells cars in 170 countries. So if you buy a Toyota car, it's actually more or less impossible to work out, work out how much of it was made in Japan and how much of it was made in other countries. If your shirt has a label saying made in China in it, it's not as simple as that. It's likely that the shirt may well have been put together in China, um, but the sewing machinery was probably made in South Korea or Japan. The dyes might have been made in Germany. The cotton might have come from Egypt. The shipping might have been by a Greek firm and the finance for the shipping might have been provided by a UK bank and so on. In other words, it, the making of something, something as simple as a shirt is a great global collaborative effort. And one measure of globalisation is the absence of explicit protectionist measures. And, and these have reduced uh, very significantly over the last 20 to 30 years. Tariff rates have reduced enormously from levels which, e even um, in countries such as Australia, levels uh, which um, today would be unimaginable in developed countries, to levels which, in the case of Australia, uh, indicate a movement towards more or less unilateral free trade. So if you go back 25 years, the average tariff rate in Australia was nearly 7%, and today it's less than 1%. In Brazil, um, just over 30 years ago, the average tariff rate was 32%. Today, it's 8.6%. In China, it was 32%. Today, it's 
3.8%. So the average tariff, tariff rate in, in China today is less than the average tariff rate in Australia back in 1995. In Nigeria, uh, there was effectively an effort to create an entirely um, self-sufficient economy and the average, average tariff rate was 91%, today it's 11%. And in India, the average tariff rate has reduced from 27% to 5.8%. This really does make a difference. Although not every study shows a strong link between globalisation and poverty reduction, there are no studies really which show the opposite. And a typical result is a study by Mitra, which suggested that a, a one percentage point increase in trade leads to a 0.15 percentage point reduction in poverty. And this is not just because of the economic benefits of increasing trade. If you remove trade protectionism, you also remove a magnet for corruption as well. And that has knock-on benefits for economic development. So what's happened to poverty? Um, well, this chart shows what's happened to poverty since 1820. If you go back to 1820, around 90% of the world's population lived in dire poverty. That means that basically they didn't have enough to live on. They were, if you like, one bad harvest away from starvation or malnutrition. If you just go forward a few years to 1850, uh, it, it's worth noting that a huge proportion of the population of Ireland, which of course today is a, a highly developed country, um, either emigrated or starved to death because of the, uh, or, or died of disease because of malnutrition, because of the, the potato famine there. And in fact, the population of Ireland is only this year uh, getting back to the levels of 1850. Not difficult to imagine that in the era of my great-great-grandfather in a country like Ireland, such a huge proportion of the population would, have to, would, would die or have to leave in order to avoid starvation uh, or um, disease and, and malnutrition. And in fact, not that much impact was made on poverty uh, in, in the following 100 years or so. And by 1980, still 40% of the world's population lived in dire poverty. And between 1980 and 2015, or between 1980 and, and the current day, that figure of 40% has been reduced to significantly under 10%. In other words, we've made around about as much progress in reducing poverty from 40% of the world's population, and this is dire, absolute poverty, to under 10% of the world's population in the last 40 years than we had in the whole of the previous several thousand years of the economic history of the world um, put together. That is a remarkable achievement, and it's one which really wouldn't have been predicted by those people who were putting um, a, a poverty in the third world on the agenda uh, in the late 1960s. Forget about the different colours, that's different continents. In 1800, 1975 and 2015, and this faint red line here, needn't worry too much about it, but that is the absolute poverty line. So, is this a pointer? Yeah. So if you go back to 1800, you see that um, the world's income, uh, the, the distribution of world incomes, it looks actually quite like the distribution of incomes in an individual country. And that's not really surprising, because almost everybody in the world was destitute, destitute at that time. It didn't really matter where you lived. And almost everybody is living below the absolute poverty line. Fast forward to 1975, and this is a really weird uh, graph. You don't often get graphs like this, in um, charts like this in, in economics, when you show distributions of things. But it essentially um, looks as if we've got the income distribution for two different planets. Um, over here we have what you might call the first world, and over here we have what you might call the third world. Indeed, we did call it the third world. In the middle, actually, you've got the communist world, which you might describe as the second world. And um, the, what has happened between 1800 and 1975 is what we often regard as developed countries has pulled away from the rest of the world, but the rest of the world has stayed behind. And that's, that's about, in, in 1980, that's about 40% of the world's population. Move up to 2015, and this, this is really astonishing, because it now looks once again as if we all live on the same planet. 
This distribution of world incomes looks very similar in shape to the distribution of incomes in almost any country in the world. And uh, what's happened is that the vast majority, over three quarters of these people who were behind the poverty line before, have now pulled themselves over the poverty line and we're only left with seven or eight percent of the world's population who are still uh, mired in absolute poverty. If you do focus on the colours for a moment, you can see that a very high proportion of those in Africa are in Africa and quite a high proportion of the rest are in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, and it's no exaggeration to say that since you've been born, you, you have lived through the first period in industrialised history where there has been a meaningful reduction in global inequality. This has never happened before. So um, there have been times before when inequality has reduced, but it's really rather meaningless because everybody had so little. It didn't mean that much. But this is the first time in 200 years in which global inequality has fallen. And you might wonder why people don't talk about it very much. Um, well, I'll come on to that in a, in, a, in a second, just mention, talk about it briefly. Um, but it, this kind of good news story applies to almost any measure uh, that you uh, care to think about. So if you look, for example, at child mortality, so this graph shows child mortality for a number of countries, and they've, not, uh, they've been somewhat randomly selected, I, I must admit. Um, and um, so here we have child mortality in Mozambique. Back in 1981, Mozambique, which was then rather war-torn, it has to be said, but still, never, nevertheless, that doesn't really matter. It's still a, um, we don't discount problems just because they arise in wars. The, the, over one in four children died between childbirth and the age of five. Um, today, that figure is about one in 17. And you can see you know, significant falls in child mortality in Nigeria, India, Indonesia, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Vietnam, um, Brazil, and, um, and, and China. And all these countries, apart from Brazil, uh, were, back in 1980, low-income countries. Um, now, other measures of, of human progress essentially say the same kind of thing. Um, this is the ratio of um, the ratio of girls to boys. Uh, the, sorry, the ratio of the years of schooling uh, by girls uh, to the years of years of schooling for girls to the years of schooling for boys. Um, and how that's changed since 19, uh, b between 1945 and 2010. Uh, and in, in, in some countries, that's had quite a dramatic change, in fact, uh, in this period I'm thinking about since 1980. Uh, but actually, it's been improving uh, really ever since the Second World War. Uh, but nevertheless, no, we, we've, uh, there's been a, a, an, in, an incredible change in what you might call gender equality when it comes to schooling uh, over the, um, in, in the post-Second World War uh, period something that you think people will be celebrating and, 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 and talking about uh, in, in a very positive way, but rarely gets mentioned. And this is um, a Human Development Index. And the Human Development Index is a, a composite index which takes into ac uh, account per capita income, education, and life expectancy. It's by no means comprehensive. And uh, uh, it's, uh, um, these numbers uh, down the side are just index numbers, so they don't mean anything uh, uh, in and of themselves, but the, the index goes from naught to one. And you can see that for the world as a whole, there's been a, uh, a big increase in the Human Development Index, which is examining the improvement in these factors. In Sub-Saharan Africa, which people still, despite um, 10 or 15 years of, years of evidence to the contrary, uh, tend to write off as a, a basket case. There's been a significant improvement in the Human Development Index. In Southern Asia um, and East Asia, there, there have been very significant improvements as, as well. And this is just since 1990, uh, I, I should add. And it, it really doesn't matter what, what measure you take. And even if you look at some of the ecological measures, such as deforestation, it's true that there are real problems in some particular countries, but there are now very, a very large number of countries which are on, on net reforesting, and the, the total amount of forest in the world is now decreasing very um, slowly. 
And we, I think rather than berating that the progress in the last 30 years and arguing that somehow uh, this has been uh, uh, dem demonstrate, demonstrates that we have real problems with uh, economic models and how we think about uh, economic uh, policy and organization. We should be asking questions, you know, why in particular countries have things not gone as well as they have elsewhere? But another question I think is, uh, which uh, uh, I, I don't want to go to in, in, in any great depth, is why do we, I think I might have talked about this last year, but why do we have such a miserable view of the world? Exacerbated and interconnected set of crises that disproportionately impact the poor and most vulnerable. Now, it was really in, in the late 1960s when all the development movements started, when you got big development charities uh, such as Oxfam, uh, CAFOD, Caritas, and so on, in the West, working in poor countries in Africa, Asia, and, and South America. And, and when these problems came to light, also through papal encyclicals, Populorum Progressio, um, uh, written by Pope Paul VI, if you had said to them, back in the late 1960s, that 40 years on, this would have happened to absolute poverty, and this would have happened to inequality, this would have happened to child mortality, and uh, this would have happened to the uh, gender equality in schooling, and this would have happened to the Human Development Index, um, they would, as, as we would say in England, have bitten your hand off for that, um, for that outcome. And, and yet we seem to be very pessimistic about what we've achieved. One of the reasons for that is just that good news has become very normal. Good news is, in fact, good news is normal all of the time. And, and so I think in news media outlets, we only tend to see bad things. No, there's something like 10,000 um, planes, I think, set off from uh, London every month. Now, there's never a news bulletin saying 10,000 planes landed safely or set off safely. But of course, if one crashes, then that really does uh, make the news. We've just had a very nice lunch. Nobody, it's never going to make the news that 25 people in a seminar in Austria have had a very nice lunch together. Um, but if a hurricane had come along and swept us all away and killed us, then that would have got into newspapers. So we, we tend to, uh, uh, bad news tends to be much more visible uh, than good news. And I think people have an incentive to exaggerate uh, bad news uh, as well for various reasons uh, uh, when working in the political process. Um, but what about COVID then? Has, has COVID somehow disproportionately um, affected, um, uh, affected the poor? Oh, actually, I've got one more slide to show you first. Yeah, okay, so at, at the beginning, I mentioned globalization, and then I've mentioned all of these improvements in, um, in, in economic outcomes, well-being, and, and, and so on, uh, um, during this period of what we often describe as a modern phase of globalization. There is a question of whether or not uh, globalization is, is causal here. In other words, is it globalization which has caused these improvements? I would suggest that there is a lot of evidence that globalization has had quite a lot to do with it. So if you look at the number of people living in uh, extreme poverty in different parts of, of the, the world, then you know you could see that the uh, biggest number is in sub-Saharan Africa, and then East Asia and the Pacific, and then South Asia. But this wasn't true back in 1990. The biggest number was, uh, uh, of people in poverty was in East Asia and Pacific, then South Asia, and then Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's really the countries in these parts of the world which have globalized very rapidly, participated in the process of liberalizing trade, whereas most Sub-Saharan African countries have tended to remain very protectionist and very cut off from, um, from uh, the world trading order. This is beginning to change, and in fact, all but one of the sub-Saharan African countries have recently signed a free trade agreement together, which some people are hopeful will make some difference in the, in the long term. But there's been very little dent made on poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. The proportion of people in poverty has, has, has fallen, but the number has um, uh, uh, either remained stable or risen. Uh, and, but those countries which have participated most rapidly in the, in the uh, process of globalization seem to have reduced poverty um, the most.
Um, but it, it, I should say it's not just globalization. It's a number of other things. Now, I'll, I'll identify one of those uh, at the end as well. So, um, uh, for example, you need internal and external peace, uh, the absence of war, in other words. You need non-corrupt governments. Uh, you need uh, effective judicial systems. You need good protection of private property rights. You need an ability for businesses to easily establish themselves. But very often these things go hand in hand with the development of trade liberalization uh, for, various, uh, for, for various institutional uh, reasons. So I think there is a causal link, and the evidence suggests that there is a causal link between um, uh, participation in globalization and improvements in um, various measures of well-being and prosperity, and in particular, in the reduction of people in extreme poverty. So what about COVID then? Um, so once again, you know, the Dicastery for Integral Human Development has said that uh, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic is a defining crisis of the generation and has laid bare the inequities and injustices that threaten people's well-being, safety, and lives, and exacerbated an inter connected set of crises and has disproportionately impacted the poor and most vulnerable. I'm afraid that's not really true either. So if you look at deaths from COVID per million uh, of, of population, um, these have by far and away been uh, concentrated in richer countries uh, in the world. Now, South America is way up at the top here, partly because of Brazil being such an extreme uh, outlier. But you can see the deaths per million in North America and Europe, which is uh, nearly uh, all the countries in those regions are uh, developed OECD economies, is much higher than the deaths per million in Asia and Africa. The people who collect these statistics think that there might be some reporting issues here, which explains only a small proportion of the difference. But actually, it's the reality of living relatively prosperous, busy, urban lives where we're all interconnected in office spaces, commuting, living closer together, and so on, which has um, promoted, the, and, and also colder climates, which have promoted the spread of COVID, and those things are more absent in Asia uh, and, and Africa. So there is no doubt, in fact, that COVID has hit richer countries to a greater extent than it's hit um, poorer countries. And if you look at the um, this, this slide here shows you the, the lost... Yes? So I have a question regarding the data from Asia. Yeah. Because Asia isn't just the poor countries like India or Bangladesh, but yep. also South Korea or Japan, for example, who have mm -hmm. um, very rigid hygiene concepts that they implemented. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but no. personally, I would define them as... D developed countries where no, of people course. also yeah, commute yeah. a lot and see each other. So, um, yeah, within yeah. the statistic for Asia, how big is the effect that those more developed countries have or mm -hmm. the poorer countries where people maybe don't meet each other, other as much? No, sure, okay. And, and there are some um, uh, poorer countries such as India and Pakistan and Bangladesh which are also quite urbanized as well, it, it should be said. Yeah. So, as far as the developed countries within Asia are concerned, I mean, they are just, they are a much smaller proportion of the population than developed countries in, in, um, uh, in, in North America and Europe. So, Japan, I think, is about 200 million, is it, population? Um, and um, South Korea is 60 million, I think. Uh, so, that, those two together are only a quarter of the population of, of India, uh, never mind China, and of course, no, China is a middle-income country now, but back in 1980, it wasn't a middle-income country. But the, the other factor about Asia, which perhaps distorts things more, is that, well, t two things. One, I think you mentioned uh, people, uh, it, it, is, it seems easier in uh, Asia to get people to comply with things like track and trace, which involve um, invasions of privacy and so on, which we wouldn't be very comfortable with in Western countries. Uh, but also they were disproportionately affected by um, the previous SARS outbreak, which in the end came to nothing in the rest of the world, but, but actually uh, affected some Asian countries quite a bit. And, and uh, they, they sort of changed their public health policies in response to that. So yeah, there are, there are differences. Um, um, these data are by no means perfect, and they're also reporting issues because you know, uh, uh, deaths in many African countries are, are, are not certified um, 
uh, very accurately, although that's also the case in Europe. But we, we certify as somebody dying with COVID if they've had a positive COVID test in the previous 28 days, regardless of what they die of. So but there, are, there are reporting accuracies. But it, it does not it, explain that, that big gap there. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say thank you, but um, so that means that basically these low numbers in uh, Asia and Africa are not comparable based on the, the reasons why they are so low. Did I understand that correctly, or at least not directly the, comparable? Okay. No, they're, they're not. So if you go to our, the, our World in Data website, which is an amazing website, it, it will explain some of the discrepancies between the, or some of the inconsistencies between the way in which data is uh, are collected. Um, so, yeah, there are inconsistencies, but those inconsistencies, are, inconsistencies in no way explain such a huge gap. Yeah. So, you, you, you couldn't do a reliable piece of econometrics with these data as yet in this state. Um, but nevertheless, they are. I'm just trying to give an indication. And, and certainly, there's no evidence if you look at deaths. Uh, there's no evidence that, uh, as was suggested in the previous slide by the dicastery, that this has affected the poor much more than, than well-off countries. It, it just hasn't. Mm -hmm. Christoph? I would uh, like to add two things. Um, uh, the fact that Africa is on, on the bottom uh, could be because their life expect expectancy is, um, I think, the lowest, and COVID uh, targets the elderly. Oh. <laughs> And, and the second is um, uh, to get around this um, confirmed COVID deaths uh, problem. There is uh, the data from, from excess deaths. So maybe this could uh, make a better picture if you look at um, the countries and the, the medium death rate uh, year to year and the excess deaths in yeah, 2020, no. but okay. yes. That, that's definitely true. And it's, um, it's, it's also true that um, that one of the reasons for um, the apparently low death rates in Asia and Africa is because there are fewer older people as a proportion of the population. Although that, that, that's also the case in South America too, but which has a very high death rate. But yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm not trying to draw any rigorous conclusions here that, that, that everything, is, everything has been fine in relation to COVID in Africa and it's been terrible in the West. I'm just saying that there isn't much evidence uh, for the proposition that this has affected the poor much worse than the rich. That's, I'm, I'm, so I'm making a weaker claim, if you like. Then, um, and this slide actually might get closer to you, what you want. So this shows the lost years of life from uh, COVID um, uh, per 100,000 people. So you can see that more or less the worst performer in the world is um, Belgium um, and uh, closely followed by Peru, actually Peru and Belgium. Peru is actually slightly worse than Belgium. But the, the interesting thing about this trend here is that the um, high income countries, the, 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 the lost years of life is much greater than in the uh, low income countries. And there's almost a, you know, that there's a pretty, um, uh, um, pretty, pretty clear trend <coughs> with the lost years of life increasing as um, the income of countries increases. And one reason for that, again, is the proportion of uh, older people. But, but the differences are really quite large. So in, in Belgium, the average person loses three days of life because of COVID. And in, if you go to the um, uh, lower income countries here, so Mozambique, the average person loses um, uh, about 40 minutes of life because of COVID. Again, that's partly because of the age distribution of the population, but it just demonstrates that this is not a disease which has affected the poor countries much more than the rich countries. Now, there has been an increase in absolute poverty. So the Brookings Institute, which is a pretty sort of neutral arbiter on, on these things, estimates that there'll be about 50 million extra people in extreme poverty um, in, uh, by 2030 as a result of uh, COVID. So, um, and um, the, the countries most impacted in terms of the increase in extreme poverty will be those where poverty was already concentrated before the pandemic, a handful of sub-Saharan African states. Um, but I don't think that suggests the need for a reset. It suggests the need to ensure that those policies which promote economic growth and resilience are spread more widely across the world than they were um, uh, previously. If sub-Saharan African countries 
had been um, more like Asian countries are in terms of their economic development in the last 30 years, we wouldn't be making a statement uh, such as that. And also, interestingly, and I was really quite surprised by this, but there is a good reason for it. In, there's, I've only seen one study of what's happened to income inequality due to COVID in European countries, and that shows that income inequality has reduced. And I think the reason for that, though, is that the additional welfare payments due to COVID have been predominantly lump sum welfare payments and have therefore proportionately benefited the less well-off um, uh, the most. So again, this narrative that, um, that COVID has affected the, the poor most, I just don't think um, really uh, stands up uh, to scrutiny. <clears throat> Now, there, is a, there was then the second question which, which I raised, which is, has COVID taught us that in order to avoid more crises like COVID, we need a different kind of economic model? So it's um, not quite the same question as, has COVID taught us that our economic model was wrong anyway, but has COVID taught us that we need to do things differently in the future in order, in order to avoid more crises like COVID? And this was very much the kind of discussion that people were having after the Second World War. Um, people saw that um, the United Kingdom centrally planned much of her economy during the Second World War, that central planning was effective in winning the war, therefore should we not have central planning in peacetime. Fortunately, fortunately for Germany, um, Germany re rejected that narrative and had more or less a market economy after the Second World War, whereas in Britain we decided to adopt central planning and it was really not very um, successful. And this is really based on the same, that the idea that we have needed the state to be involved in um, dealing with COVID, and therefore we need the state to be involved in the post-COVID economy, is really built upon the same um, kind of myth as the uh, myth that built up in Britain during the Second World War, that we planned the war, therefore we need to uh, plan the peace. If you're fighting a war, and if you're fighting um, a, a disease, then essentially you have one overwhelming objective. Um, you, the the um, well-being of society as a whole is threatened, and the enemy needs to be defeated uh, in the case of war. And um, in the case of the, the disease, the enemy of the disease needs to be defeated. Now, the private sector might be used an awful lot uh, in, that, um, in, in that process, but the... Um, uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, the, the, the general approach of the government procuring economic resources in order to achieve the immediate single objective uh, is one which um, uh, can get widely accepted during emergencies and crises. But the point is, no, in peacetime, we all have different objectives. Uh, this is the picture you get if you Google, in Google Images, diverse workplace. You know, we all, we all want to, um, we, we, we all want to, uh, uh, we all have different aspirations when it comes to uh, where we want to work, what we want to consume, what we want to produce. And price signals are the best way to coordinate um, those different aspirations and ensure that our uh, preferences are, are met. So peacetime just is not the same as wartime. The fact that you have to use the state to deal with COVID and to try and eliminate COVID doesn't demonstrate that the state is better uh, in general when it comes to um, uh, planning economic life than allowing market forces uh, to prevail. The second myth which seems to have built up is that uh, globalization is a real problem uh, in, um, uh, and has been demonstrated to be a problem by COVID because it's made us less resilient. Now, a lot of figures in the United States in particular have suggested that the um, pandemic shows that we need to be more self-sufficient and depend less uh, on trade. So, and, and that argument is, is used um, uh, specifically in relation to things like the procurement of personal uh, protective equipment. Um, and this, is, this narrative is feeding into um, the sort of uh, post-Trump uh, situation wh whereby th there are a number of threats to world trade and globalization wh which had been evolving over the previous four or five years. So if you take the last World Trade Organization report before COVID struck, then you would find that the uh, WTO World Trade Organization members implemented um, trade restrictive measures cov covering about three quarters of a trillion dollars of imports 
in the previous um, year. And that was an increase of 27% compared with the previous annual review. So there's already a growth in protectionism when COVID struck. And the, the COVID, um, I think, fed protectionist uh, narratives. But actually, what we found is, in reality, is, is precisely uh, the, the opposite. In the United States, for example, during the uh, pandemic, the rate of mask use increased 200 times. That's protective masks. The, the need for respirators increased 17-fold. Now, you simply could not have had that level of provision in the United States, and the same is true of the United Kingdom, um, provided without a global supply chain, and in particular, without countries which had been less affected by COVID, uh, contributing to the, um, uh, to, to the uh, production of uh, respirators, masks, and so on, which were then imported by the United States. The US, like the UK, shuttered large parts of its economy, and it wouldn't have been possible for the US and the UK to produce all those things domestically. It relied on imports from those parts of the world that were less affected by COVID. So globalization actually provides resilience by providing diversification. You're no longer so reliant on domestic production, which might be damaged by, um, by, by the pandemic. And uh, just to, to give one example here of, of, of uh, globalization uh, at, at work, the BioNTech vaccine is being produced by a, a German company. I know a little bit less about this than I do about the Astra, AstraZeneca one. I, I believe that German company was founded by Turks. It's got an office in Cambridge, lots of other places too. It's funded um, to quite a large degree by US and Japanese capital. Um, the vaccine is produced in Germany, but also lots of other places around the world and uses Canadian technology. That, so that type of specialization has uh, has been brought together by the process of globalization to produce this vaccine, um, which is now being used in large number of countries around the world. If each country had tried to be self-sufficient in vaccine production, we wouldn't have a vaccine today. We wouldn't be sitting here around this table. And to, to give a, a rather trivial example, th this is a Tunnock's tea cake, which um, uh, one eats with one's uh, tea on, in, in, in an afternoon uh, in, in England. And it's produced in a factory in Dundee. Uh, and um, there's no global supply chain involved at all. It's uh, produced only in Dundee and uh, in, in, in Scotland. And for several weeks, because of COVID, because they couldn't adapt their production line to be COVID safe, um, there were no Tunnock's tea cakes or Tunnock's caramel wafers um, uh, on, uh, in, in the shops. Uh, had Tunnock's tea cakes been produced all around the world, then you would have been able to get them from somewhere, from a country which was less affected by covid uh, than the United Kingdom. So if we turn this around, you know, if Tunnock's tea cakes have been produced by a German company founded by Turks with an office in Cambridge funded by US and Japanese capital uh, using Canadian technology with factories all around the world and um, the vaccine had been produced only in a factory in Dundee, we'd have loads of Tunnock's tea cakes and no vaccines. How would I conclude? Well, Whatever, you, whatever looks objectionable about the old normal. No, nobody likes to see um, uh, poverty at all. There are clearly large numbers of countries where you have large amounts of poverty. But the old normal was pretty good compared with any previous uh, epoch of economic development. And not only that, the speed of improvement was just unprecedented. And the speed of improvement benefited the poorest people in the world um, um, the, the most. Secondly, the idea that COVID harmed poor countries much more than rich countries is demonstrably false. Now, the, the figures I showed might not prove the opposite, that it harmed rich countries much more, but it's demonstrably false that COVID harmed poor countries uh, more. I think that the idea that COVID demonstrates that we should have more government intervention rather than less government intervention in the economy is also false. We tried that after the Second World War and it, did, it really didn't work um, out very well. So what I would suggest is rather than a reset, that we, we actually have a redoubling of the efforts that were going on to try to improve economic life in the world's poorest countries um, before the COVID uh, crisis. We know pretty well what the conditions are which can enable a good life, uh, in which good life can flourish uh, and, and, and which markets can, can flourish. It's the absence of corruption, Actually, Pope Francis talks a lot about corruption, which, uh, to, to his credit. It's strongly enforced property rights with well-functioning le legal systems, 
the ability to easily establish, establish businesses and run those businesses without burdensome regulation. Um, there's a very good, it's really quite emotional, but it's, it's, it's very good, uh, TED talk by somebody called Maget Wade, who um, runs businesses in Africa. And she talks about the, the sheer difficulty of getting Wi-Fi connections, of getting electricity connections for factories and, and this type of thing in countries um, which have corrupt um, governments. And of course, peace. Now, one of the reasons why Africa has prospered, relatively speaking, uh, since 2005, is that there's been a dramatic reduction in the number of civil wars uh, in Africa. So people often use, and once again, Pope Francis has often used the phrase um, that, that, pe that, that very many people are excluded by markets. I would just, I would just change the um, preposition there, and I, I would suggest that the problem is that people are excluded from markets, and they're excluded from markets because the basic conditions for a market economy um, don't exist as widely as we would like them uh, to exist. And uh, whatever you say about globalization, where we can have a good debate, I think this um, data is really indisputable. Now, the question is, um, when it comes to um, the uncorrupt legal systems and the protection of property rights, where would you like to live? In the top 10 countries for um, well-functioning, uncorrupt legal systems, or in the bottom 10 countries? Now, you might say, yeah, okay, this is extreme. Um, there are, um, <coughs> we, we, we know there are problems in, in um, Yemen, Sudan, and so on and so forth, but Venezuela was a, was a well-functioning um, uh, democratic country until about 20 years ago. Uh, it's, uh, it's changed because its attitude towards um, corruption and the protection of property rights has changed. But also, it doesn't matter how you sort this data. So if you, if you just looked at property rights and legal systems for European countries, then the bottom three are Bosnia, North Macedonia, and Montenegro. Now, much better places to live than, um, than, than these 10 countries here, but not as good, I would suggest, as the top 10 there. It doesn't matter how you sort this data on property rights and legal systems. It's very difficult to find anything other than a very clear relationship between the protection of property rights and well-functioning legal systems, the conditions for businesses to flourish, and economic well-being. Uh, and basically, um, Adam Smith had it right in a lecture in 1755. Um, what he said was, little else is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest degree of barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice, all the rest being brought about by the natural course of things. All governments which thwart this nat natural course, which force things into another channel, or which endeavor to arrest the progress of society at a particular point, are unnatural, and to support themselves are obliged to be oppressive and tyrannical. And I think that's a very good quotation, which, you know, from 1755, 250 years ago, it's amazing, really, that it really, oops, gone the wrong way again. I had meant to say that it had um, explained so well the data on the um, previous slide. Thanks.